Get rid of that. You need to have some sort of decentralized system where everyone could just be a participant in this network and that would enable me to send money from you know, myself straight to the other person on the end of the internet. Yeah, who I'm here, let me it's actually Bitcoin's fodder out, so it's like censorship resistant see. money. But in order to do yeah, that, you need to yeah. have some way of distributing Still the information about who owns what recording. Bitcoin for everyone who's on the internet. And uh, that turns out to be a fairly difficult problem and you need something for the blockchain. And the blockchain is essentially a ledger or a journal or a database, depending on you know, who you are, that is able to maintain a consistent record between all the people that are connected to the Bitcoin network. So, if I give you a Bitcoin today, I would need to sign the transaction as valid, and then all the participants on the network could agree that I actually sent money from what we call my Bitcoin address to your Bitcoin address. And the way that they do that is there's two mechanisms. One is a kind of security mechanism, which is that in order for me to send Bitcoin to someone, we use what we call public key cryptography. Essentially, I wonder I if I caused that, that with that my leg or if I was just, just announcing. The holder of a private key that corresponds to a Bitcoin address. So the Bitcoin address I need to spend some time hammering out my. Come and pay me at. They usually start the one or the three. And Bitcoin transaction somewhere. These guys. When I reassign Bitcoin. This is definitely a turkey, so anybody who wants to say that we don't have turkeys around here, that's a turkey. Okay. Come on, we have turkey. Compromise my private key. So I have to keep that very secure. And there's lots of people working on how we, how we secure those keys and it's really important for not making Bitcoin. One thing I've also wondered as I've learned more about this is how you can like pass a reset. Like a piece of security question, like if you forget what your key is, are you totally up a creek? Because there's no like governing body to it, no one can help you recover your Bitcoin or navigate where things went. And is that just having a thing? Not exactly. So there are technological solutions to it. You can split these keys up into different parts. So you can have, say I trust you, you could be one signature. I would have one key. Then I could keep one with a Google or a Facebook or I could keep with any sort of third party that might ask me the security questions to unlock that key, given yeah, that you lose it. Like, running thing you know, over there, but he can't be bothered to use it. They're you know, doing great work for individuals and exchanges to help you know, key manage. As you're aware, I mean, I lose my house keys. I also lost a few Bitcoin keys, and so, you know, some of the keys There's luckily technological solutions. Well, the second feature of Bitcoin, so there's like two features that enable us to send money over the internet. One is this sort of security mechanism. And the nice thing about the security mechanism is it requires no third party that anyone can generate a Bitcoin address. Anyone can then create a valid signed Bitcoin transaction, which is what you need instead of having some third party authenticate people are using these free security. So that's really important. And then the second part is that we need to be able to come to consensus. And so Bitcoin has this sort of quite mystical way of doing it, which isn't so mystical, but people will like, think about that way. Well, it's shot in words like hashing and mining. mining. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the brand management should, should be shot. But the, the purpose behind it is to create cost to participants. Mm -hmm. So in a decentralized system where anyone can participate, that also means that a malicious attacker can come and participate. And so what you're going to do is you're going to raise the cost for even the legitimate people to participate in the system and sort of cost people loads of which is valid in order to deter a malicious attacker. So you hope that you've got enough value as, let's say, at stake or enough deterrent to prevent uh, an attack from taking over the network. Because in order to take over the network, and this is kind of the baseline scenario, is that an attacker would need to compromise 51% of all the computing power that goes behind creating this, this chain of blocks. It's not, it's not impossible. I mean, so, so there's people have large mining farms, so humans that create these machines, and so you obviously foresee a scenario where someone does take over and produce more machines than other people and have maybe have some incentive to shut down the Bitcoin network or, or really cause havoc. That's gonna make a great Michael Bay movie someday. <laughs> or maybe, I mean, you know, another movie script would be there are large mining pools or large entities that control substantial amounts of the computing power that's out there, and you know, through social engineering or through you know, sort of brute force, you might be able to co opt those people. And so, you know, the dream initially from the, the white paper that came out in November 2008, uh, finally released on January 3rd, 2009, was that everyone in the world who could connect to the internet would have some sort of vote. There would be one CPU, one vote. But the problem is that the, the actual security mechanism in Bitcoin is such that you could create a specialist computer that's far more effective than an Apple Mac mm -hmm. um, at mining Bitcoin. And that means that some people have been professionalized, and so some people are much better than others. So that's the kind of Bitcoin backstory, and that's how I start, because it, it started to give people this idea about you know, sharing information between different parties over the internet. And so people go look at financial services, and they say, financial services, banks aren't really internet-based institutions. And people like to think about ways in which you can be on different banks about kind of new technologies that enable greater data sharing, a more standardized way of sharing data between different banks, interoperability between banks. And so perhaps it's right to say that Bitcoin causes this kind of focal point concentration on how are we going to store and share data in the future, and you know, at least the most well recognized name is and it's kind of been this capture, you know, there's very different interpretations of what that might mean, but it has been this kind of movement around. To be very skeptical, we bring aside some sort of executive and some of major which might be companies, so we can do something proper, something to share with The actual implementation will be real and hopefully we'll save the infrastructure cost. It's just that the terminology has sort of sense around this thing that maybe it won't be a blockchain, maybe it'll be just a database, maybe it'll be it, it's very difficult to define, especially in these sort of private contexts what blockchain really is. So the blockchain can exist separately from Bitcoin. Bitcoin is one integration of the blockchain, Ethereum has another blockchain. The blockchain is essentially an internet that people can tailor to their needs. But Bitcoin works well because they're incentivized monetarily to keep up the ledger. Yeah, so the chain of blocks of Bitcoin to get really like into the specifics of it. The reason why we have a chain of blocks is because it's very difficult in a decentralized network, so where there are lots of nodes all over the world, to have um, consensus about what's just happened in the moment. Because there's a lot of latency. And say for example, I start shouting this transaction happens and someone else starts shouting a conflicting transaction happens. Very almost possible for us to think about ways to come to consensus about what's just happened. And that's really the innovation behind Bitcoin. They say, well, okay, we actually have these blocks of transactions and artificially make it quite slow at agreeing what transactions have just happened. And the feature that, that Bitcoin has is that when you take a sequence of blocks, you can actually see how much computing power has gone into generating that sequence of blocks. It's almost like the mathematical formula to back out you know, how many literal computer cycles have been expended in generating that chain of blocks. Whereas in a private setting where there might be five nodes and you don't deal with latency, and you don't deal with the lack of identity that Bitcoin has, you might just have each transaction fine. You might not need this kind of 
idea to have a sequence of blocks that have some sort of signature inside. Yeah, you might have every row of the database being signed by all the parties to make sure that everyone has agreed that this is actually happening. You might have a design which is more like a round robin in which there's an election over the person that can publish um, at any one time. And that's sort of a different type of... That's another episode. That's another episode. So why are people so obsessed with decentralization lately? Is it because we're all realizing that there are like free companies that own all of our why? data and there's now this, it's kind of ignited this need to be anonymous and to have more ownership over our behavior and actions or is it something else? It's a great question. I mean, I'm kind of deep in the weeds and the depths of the industry and find it difficult to think about, you know, all of like the sociological drivers. So I think I think there's, I mean, two types of drivers. One is sort of social, probably economic in that, uh, and one's going to be technological. So some of this stuff literally wasn't possible before. The mechanisms to decentralize systems are very hard, and, and that's why people are so excited about Bitcoin, because it, you know, although it's got this sort of computing power, the need for computing power to, to secure it, it, it does create a greater form of decentralization of currency than we've ever seen in the digital realm. So you know, that's on the technological side, I think, so our ability to manage the private keys and to create great user experiences around data privacy, user autonomy, are now you know, faster than, than what we've had before. I mean, a great example of that is PGP email. I, mean, I, I go to tons of sessions and I ask, you know, even pretty tech savvy people, you know, who uses PGP email, and you know, that's encrypted email using quite similar pieces to what we have in Bitcoin. You know, hardly anyone uses it because the user experience is just so different. So I think one is technological, the other, the other is social and economic. You know, you see a lot of uh, disturbing revelations, the need for greater transparency in government, the need for greater transparency in financial institutions, financial crisis fuels you know, a lot of the interest in, in understanding our relationships of trust and whatnot. So I think when I got into Bitcoin, I was you know, excited not so much necessarily as Bitcoin as a solution, but Bitcoin is posing some of the most important questions about the status quo. And so I think that still is very true. And when you look at you know, Bitcoin, if you look at like, distributed ledgers, I think it's about really understanding the span of control idea of being able to create different trust lines and different organizational structures rather than you know, keeping everything as is and shaving three seconds off the second time. But most of the right. Even thinking about open house derivatives is about thinking about how can you reduce that participants? Are there technological solutions that we can change the fundamental trust dynamic between two parties that are doing such trade? And it's also about, you know, if you're looking at another sort of spectrum, how much privacy can you have in financial services as well as you know, affordability? So there's, you know, I think when people look at this sector, people look to it for solutions. And in fact, I would say that we might be in an age of just asking people the right questions without the questions. So what to you personally was most intriguing about learning about Bitcoin and blockchain at the pub in Oxford years ago? Yeah, so we started, we started with a very similar idea to lots of people. There's a law in economics with the law of one price, and that you know, if the same good is selling for different prices in different locations, what happens is someone takes advantage of the arbitrage opportunity and brings it back down to the law of one price. And so my, one of my first interests was that the, the price of Bitcoin should be second in the UK, so it's in the US, and it sort of turned out back in the days that there was a huge arbitrage opportunity between different chains. Oh, really? And so one of the first things that anyone, sort of very technical, or, or anyone actually, who was reading about Bitcoin early on, and even still to this day, that one of the first things that people think about is, is creating an arbitrage block, which is basically free money. And you know, we thought about that, we, we started talking about it, we never actually got it going, but that was my first foray. And then, I don't know, I mean, I guess very selfishly, I was intrigued by the lack of engagement by economists, that, that I thought that the intersection of computer science and economics is, you know, a really fruitful area for research, and there just wasn't enough people looking at it. And so I was sort of deeply challenged in the sense that there was no prior stuff for me to really look at, and I had to, you know, go from looking at you know, white paper, different source code, like different code, to, to understanding what the, the economic model looked like. And one final thing that I thought was, is that economics fundamentally concerns mm. human beings. Oftentimes, it's very difficult to, to even write down what constraints we face as humans. We have like a lot of social stuff. Yeah, but, I mean, it's just quite difficult to write down even your, your objective function, sort of what, what we're trying to achieve. And, and in Bitcoin, it's very simple. And actually, I, I like the fact that there was a bunch of code being written down, and those were the rules of the game. Uh, and then you can try and construct a quite pure set of rules rather than in real life. If anyone you know, wants to think about blockchain application, think about trust, think about control. Like that's fundamental what these patterns. I mean, especially in the decentralized context, what that means is that you can embed a piece of information in this ledger with no, with no trust in another person. Or you might escrow some money in some service without with very limited exposure to that person, very little trust between you. So you know, it's all models like that when you think about decentralized applications that really are exciting. What do you think are the most exciting examples of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think experimentation at this point is, is like the best thing. I mean, even things that look just completely aesthetic and nothing to do with, you know, improving on any technology. That's a very interesting thing. Dogecoin is like an awesome social experiment. And, you know, it was a real joke by some guys in San Francisco. It makes it into a game now. It's not going around the track. We can't all see the world, so it's going to be fun. Well, I think, it's, I think that was like a great lesson in how like, people construct value and like uh, keep gaining community around this thing. I think the best application of blockchain technology, the decentralized context, I think escrow is incredibly oh, yeah. interesting uh, in terms of reducing capital yeah, flows. I, I think that identity management is interesting. I think well, the registration of intellectual property fun, in these ledgers is also Might interesting. Have to watch the method for going down that route for something like identity or something like intellectual property registration is that you might be embedding information in a system that far outlives a private entity. And, and also, you, know, you don't require the private entity to really be there, and you can create interoperability between the private entities. So, um, you know, those, those advantages are not critical. I often think that we live in a time where we assume that companies are currently using it, or currently storing their music, or storing it stuff, will be around in 20, 50 years. And you know, the reality might be completely different. And so, you know, with stuff like identity, with stuff like intellectual property management, some of that stuff is, might be quite interesting to look at the possibility of doing that information something that's decentralized.
think the other thing that I've started to think about, which is, you know, there are a lot of interactions which should really happen bilaterally and um, should really happen peer to peer. This is one of, also one of the first things that I thought about when I was getting involved in, in Bitcoin was I was part of a group that was going to form the Oxford Pound, a local currency based in Oxford. And you know, fundamentally, I just, I just I'm sick and tired of walking into a, you know, a local shop and paying with a Visa card and rewarding shareholders of Visa for my purchase of something locally going to Oxford. Like, that didn't make any sense to me, and I was interested in ways to change that. Now, there's lots of reasons why you want to change that, around local currency, but I say that, you know, one of the things that my vehicle cool application I'm currently thinking about is, you know, tying some sort of digital asset to if I, if I go in and buy some tomatoes, I might be able to get a digital receipt which might directly by the store that gives me some sort of record that might give me some benefits. So it could be that the thing between Tesla and It's interesting to think about the time, so, you know, like, I should go in or it might be I guess it depends on how much fluid I take in, but I'm not gonna have using the restroom once an hour. I don't think Google's calculating that on their time. How long it takes to get places. So we also need to I can like shove an absurd application in the good category to sort of not out any, anyone, dismissing any, any actual like I think the um like don't don't put sensitive data into the blockchain directly. So like healthcare is a long way away from being. Well, yeah, blockchain. I mean there's there's ways that you can do it so that for example, you actually might want to store certain types of healthcare records in the, in the blockchain. The blockchain is incredibly good for proof of publication, proof that something happened at a given point in time. So you know I always walk into my doctor's clinic and they say when did you get your rabies shot, when did you get this shot, and that shot, and I say well I actually have no idea. And if there was some sort of proof of publication mechanism, that would be the. Maybe a lot of sticks. Yeah, or a lot of bruises in my left arm. Some of the worst applications are actually on the currency side. You know, there are some incredible payment experiences out there in FinTech at the moment. And unless you are radically transforming how that transaction, like, like what I was saying about issuing receipts at the digital store, rather than just trying to replace that payment, the actual act of like, transmitting money from me to the merchant, I have awesome experience using a capture payment card that you know, I can maintain a constant balance in my account and I don't need to you know, whip out my smartphone and sort of fumble around with QR codes. The user experience is still being better in Bitcoin, but that's not the purpose of Bitcoin. The purpose of Bitcoin is to radically change you know, how we interact with people. I've also heard that Bitcoin has been very enthusiastically adopted by people who live in countries where their own currency is more volatile than Bitcoin. It's only true in terms of 